beginning is a very delicate time. Know then that it is the year 10,191. The known universe is ruled by the Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV, my father. In this time, the most precious substance in the universe is the spice melange. The spice extends life. The spice expands consciousness. The spice is vital to space travel. The Spacing Guild and its navigators, who the spice has mutated over 4,000 years, use the orange spice gas which gives them the ability to fold space. That is, travel to any part of the universe without moving. Oh yes, I forgot to tell you. The spice exists on only one planet in the entire universe. A desolate, dry planet with vast deserts. Hidden away within the rocks of these deserts are a people known as the Fremen, who have long held a prophecy that a man would come, a messiah, who would lead them to true freedom. The planet is Arrakis, also known as June. Begin by simply listening, slow down, see just how peaceful today can be. Greetings children, it is I, your obedient servant, Sebastian St. Smalls. Starting off with Lord of the Rings, Street Fighter. Thanks so much for swinging by, wish us luck, catch you guys on the flip side. A long expected party. When Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag End announced that he would shortly be celebrating his 11th birthday with a party of special magnificence, there was much talk and excitement in Hobbiton. Bilbo was very rich and very peculiar, and had been the wonder of the Shire for 60 years, ever since his remarkable disappearance and unexpected return. The riches he had brought back from his travels had now become a local legend, and it was popularly believed, whatever the old folk might say, that the hill at Bag End was full of tunnels stuffed with treasure. And if that was not enough for fame, there was also his prolonged vigor to marvel at. Time wore on, but it seemed to have little effect on Mr. Baggins. At 90 he was much the same as at 50. At 99 they began to call him underscore well underscore preserved, but underscore unchanged underscore would have been nearer the mark. There were some that shook their heads and thought this was too much of a good thing. It seemed unfair that anyone should possess, apparently, perpetual youth as well as, reputedly, inexhaustible wealth. It will have to be paid for, they said. It isn't natural, and trouble will come of it. But so far trouble had not come, and as Mr. Baggins was generous with his money, most people were willing to forgive him his oddities and his good fortune. He remained on visiting terms with his relatives, except, of course, the Sackville Bagginses, and he had many devoted admirers among the hobbits of poor and unimportant families. But he had no close friends, until some of his younger cousins began to grow up. The eldest of these, and Bilbo's favorite, was young Fredu Baggins. When Bilbo was 99, he adopted Fredu as his heir, and brought him to at Bag End, and the hopes of the Sackville Bagginses were finally dashed. Bilbo and Fredu happened to have the same birthday, the 22nd of September. You had better come and live here, for do my lad said Bilbo one day, and then we can celebrate our birthday parties comfortably together. At that time Fredu was still in his underscore tweens underscore as the hobbits called the irresponsible twenties between childhood and coming of age of 33. Twelve more years passed. Each year the Bagginses had given very lively combined birthday parties at Bag End, but now it was understood that something quite exceptional was being planned for that autumn. Bilbo was going to be underscore 11 to 1 underscore 111, a rather curious number and a very respectable age for a hobbit. The old took himself had only reached 130, and Fredu was going to be underscore 33 underscore 33, an important number, the date of his coming of age. 
Tanks began to wrap in hobbies and by water, and rumor of the coming event traveled all over the Shire. The history and character of Mr. Bilbo Baggins became once again the chief topic of the conversation, and the older folk suddenly found their reminiscences in welcome demand. No one had a more attentive audience than old Ham Gandhi, commonly known as the Gaffer. He held forth at underscore the Ivy Bush underscore this morning on the Bywater Road, and he spoke with some authority, for he had tended the garden at Bayard for 40 years, and had helped old Holman in the same job before that. Now that he was himself growing old and stiff in the joints, the job was mainly carried on by his youngest son, Sam Gandhi. Both father and son were on very friendly terms with Bilbo and Fredo. They lived on the hill itself, in number three back shot row just below Bag End. A very nice well-spoken gentle bit is Mr. Bilbo, as I've always said the gaffer declared. With perfect truth, for Bilbo was very polite to him, calling him Master Hanfast, and consulting him constantly upon the growing of vegetables in the matter of roots, especially potatoes. The gaffer was recognized as the leading authority by all in the neighborhood, including himself. But what about this dude that lives with him? Asked Old Notes of yeah. Bayuta. Baggins is his name, but he's more than half a grand buck, they say. It beats me why any Baggins of Hobbiton should go looking for a wife away there in Buckland, where folks are so queer. And no wonder they're queer putting Daddy Two Foot, the gaffer's next door neighbor, if they live on the wrong side of the Brandywine River, and right in the old forest. That's a dark bad place, if half the tales be true. You're right, Dad, said the gaffer. Not that the Brandy Bucks of Buckland live underscore and underscore the old forest, but they are a queer breed, seemingly. They fall about and go from that big river that oh, isn't no. natural. Small wonder that trouble came of it, I say. But be that as it may, Mr. Fredo is as nice a young hobbit as you wish to meet. Very much like Mr. Yeah. Elbow, and in all the looks. After all, his father was a baggins. A decent, respectable hobbit was Mr. Trotter Baggins, and there was never much to tell of him, till he was drowned. Drowned, said several voices. They had heard this and other dark rumors before, of course, but hobbits have a passion for family history, and they were ready to hear it again. Well, so they say, said the gaffer. You see, Mr. Drogo, you married poor Miss Crimea the Grand Diva. She was our Mr. Gilbert's first cousin on her mother's side, her mother being the youngest of the oldest daughters, and Mr. Drogo was his second cousin. So Mr. Fredo and his first underscore and underscore second cousin once more moved by the way, as the same is, if you follow me. And Mr. Drogo was staying at Grandy Hall with his father-in-law, old master Bogardo, as he often did after his marriage, in being partial to his fiddles, and old Bogardo keeping a mighty generous table, he went out underscore boating underscore the Grandy White River, and he and his wife were drowned, and poor Mr. Fredo only a child at all. And heard they went on the water after dinner in the moonlight said old things, and it was Drogo's way to sunk the boat. And underscore I underscore her, she pushed him in, and he caught her in after him, said Sunday the Hobbit in the mirror. You shouldn't listen to all you hear, Sunday man said the gaffer, who did not much like a mirror. There isn't no call to go talking of pushing and healing. Folks are quite tricky enough for those that sit still without looking further for the cause of trouble. Anyway, there was this Mr. Fadoo left in the water and stranded, as you might say, among those clear buckanders, being brought up any how in Randy Hall. A regular boy, by all accounts. Old Master Paul Bardock never had fewer than a couple of hundred relations in the place. Mr. Bilbo never did a kind of deed when he brought the lad back to him among decent folk. But I reckon it was a nasty shock for those at the Abaginses. They thought they were going to get back end, the time when he went off and was thought to be dead. And then he comes back and orders the rock, and he goes on living and living, and never looking a day older, bless him. And suddenly he produces hair, and has all the papers made out proper. The sackville Waggonses won't never see the inside of back end now, or it is to be hoped not. There's a tidy bit of money tucked away up there, I hear tell said a stranger, a visitor on business from Michel Delvin in the West Harvey. All the top of your room is full of tunnels packed with chests of gold and silver, underscore and underscore jewels, by what I've heard. Then you've heard more than I can speak to answer the gaffer. I know nothing about underscore jewels, but underscore Mr. Bilbo is free with his money, and there seems no lack of it, but I know of no tunnel making. I saw Mr. Bilbo when he came back, a matter of 60 years ago, when I was a lad. I've not long prevented his old home from being 
my life's puzzle, but he had me up and back and helping him to keep folks from trampling and trespassing all over the garden while the sale was gone. And in the middle of it all, Mr. Bilbo comes up the hill with a pony and some mighty big bags and a couple of chests. I don't doubt they were mostly full of treasure he had picked up in foreign parts, where there'd be mountains of gold, they say, but there wasn't enough to build tunnels. But my lad son will know more about that. He's in and out of Bag End. Crazy about stories of the old days he is, and he listens to all Mr. Bilbo's tales. Mr. Bilbo has learned in his letters meaning no harm, mark you, and I hope no harm will come of it. Underscore elves and dragons underscore I says to him. Underscore cabbages and potatoes are better for me and you. Don't go getting mixed up in the business of your betters, or you'll land in trouble too big for you underscore I says to him. And I might say it to others he added with the look of the stranger and the winner. But the gaffer did not convince his audience. The legend of Bilbo's wealth was now too firmly fixed in the minds of the younger generation of hobbits. Ah, uh, but he has likely enough been adding to what he bought at first argued the miller, what is in common opinion. He's often away from home. And look at yeah. the outlandish folk that visit him, dwarfs coming at night, and that old wandering conjurer, Gandalf, and all. You can say what you like, gaffer. But that ends a queer place, and it's so far queer. And you can say underscore what you underscore like, about what you know no more of than you do of voting, Mr. Sunderman retorted the gaffer, disliking the miller even more than usual. If that's being queer, then we could do with a bit more queerness in these parts. There's some not far away that wouldn't offer a pint of beer to a friend, if they lived in a hole with golden walls. But they do things proper at Bag End. Our son says that underscore and underscore going to be invited to the party, and there's going to be presents, mark you, presents for all this very month as is. That very month was September, and as far as you could ask. A day or two later rumor, probably started by the knowledgeable son, was spread about that there were going to be fireworks on the <laughs> What is more, such as had not been seen in the Shire for nigh on a century, not indeed since the old took died. Days passed and the day drew nearer. An odd-looking wagon maiden with odd-looking packages rolled into Hobbit and one evening and toiled up the hill to back end. The startled Hobbits peered out of Lancet doors to gape at it. It was driven by outlandish folk, singing strange songs, dwarfs with long beards and deep heads. A few of them remained at back end. What have you done? At the end of the second week in September, a cart came through by water from the direction of the Brandywine Bridge in broad daylight. An old man was driving it all alone. He wore a tall pointed blue hat, a long grey cloak, and a silver scarf. He had a long white beard and bushy eyebrows that stuck out along the brim of his hat. Small hobbit children ran after the cart or flew hobbit and right up the hill. It had a cargo of fireworks, as they rightly guessed. At Elmo's front door the old man began to load. There were great bundles of fireworks of all sorts and shapes. What the made hey? the large red jean and the elf moon. This is crazy. That was Gandalf smart, ha of course, and the old man was Gandalf the wizard, whose fame in the Shire was due mainly to his skill with fires, smokes, and lights. His real business was far more difficult and dangerous, but the Shire for the new... Do I have a double jump? What? To the view is just one of their attractions. Give me the, the key. Party. Hence the excitement of the hobby children. <laughs> Jeeple ground, they shouted, and the old man smiled. Whatever you're trying to do is a computer, you're not helping. The hobbit occasionally and oh. never stopped long, but neither they or any but the oldest of their elders have seen one of his firework displays they now belong to the legendary past. When the old man, helped by Bilbo and some dwarfs, had finished unloading, Bilbo gave a few pennies away, but not a single squib or cracker was forthcoming, to the disappointment of the onlookers. Run away now, said Gandalf. You will get plenty when the time comes. Then he disappeared oh, yeah, inside of the Bilbo, and the door was shut. The young hobbits stared at the door in vain for a while, and then made off, feeling that the day of the party would never come. Inside Bag End, Bilbo and Gandalf were sitting at the open window of a small room looking out west onto the garden. The late afternoon was bright and peaceful. The flowers glowed red and golden, snapdragons and sunflowers, and nasturtiums trailing all over the turf walls and peeping in at the round windows. How bright your garden looks, said Gandalf. Yes, said Bilbo. I am very fond indeed of it, and of all the dear old Shire, but I think I need a holiday. You mean to go on with your plan then? I do. I made up my mind months ago, and I haven't changed it. 
Very well. It is no good saying any more. Stick to your plan, your whole plan, right? And I hope it will turn out for the best, for you, and for all of us. I hope so. Anyway, I mean to enjoy myself on Thursday and have my little joke. You will laugh, I wonder, said Gandalf, shaking his head. We shall see, said Odo. But the next day more carts rolled up the hill, and still more carts. There might have been some grumbling about dealing locally, but that very week orders began to pour out of bag end for every kind of provision, commodity, or luxury that could be obtained in Hobbit or by water or anywhere in the neighborhood. People became enthusiastic, and they began to tick off the days on the calendar, and they watched eagerly for the postman, hoping for invitations. Before long the invitations began pouring out, and the Hobbiton post office was blocked, and the Bywater post office was soon under, and voluntary assistant postmen were closed. <laughs> there was a constant stream of them going up the hill, carrying hundreds of polite variations on underscore. <laughs> 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 But why? disappeared on the gate at Bag End, no admittance except on party business. Even those who had, or pretended to have party business were seldom allowed inside. Bilbo was busy, writing invitations, ticking off answers, packing up presents, and making some private preparations of his own. From the time of Gandalf's arrival he remained hidden from view. One morning the hobbits woke to find the large field, south of Bilbo's front door, covered with ropes and poles for tents and pavilions. A special entrance was cut into the bank leading to the road, and white steps and a large white gate were built there. The three hobbit families of Bagshot Road, adjoining the field, were intensely interested and generally envied. Old Gaffer Gamby stopped even pretending to work in his garden. The tents began to go up. There was a specially large pavilion, so big that the tree that grew in the field was right inside it, and stood proudly near one end, at the head of the chief table. Lanterns were hung on all its branches. More promising still, to the hobbit's mind an enormous open-air kitchen was erected in the north corner of the field. A draft of cooks, from every inn and eating house for miles around, arrived to supplement the dwarfs and other hot folk that were haunted at Bag End. Excitement rose to its height. Then the weather clouded over. That was on Wednesday the eve of the party. Anxiety was intense. Then Thursday, September the 22nd, actually dawned. The sun got up, the clouds vanished, flags were unfurled and the fun began. Bilbo Baggins called it a underscore party underscore but it was really a variety of entertainments rolled into one. Practically everybody living here was invited. A very few were overlooked by accident. But as they turned up all the same, that did not matter. Many people from other parts of the Shire were also asked, and there were even a few from outside the borders. Bilbo met the guests, and additions, at the new white gate in person. He gave away presents to all and sundry the latter were those who went out again by back way and came again by the gate. Hobbits give presents to other people on their own birthdays. Not very expensive ones, as a rule, and not so lavishly as on this occasion. But it was not a bad system. Actually in Hobbiton and by water every day in the year it was somebody's birthday, so that every Hobbit in those parts had a fair chance of at least one present at least once a week. But they never got tired of them. On this occasion the presents were unusually good. The Hobbit children were so excited that for a while they almost forgot about eating. There were toys the like of which they had never seen before, all beautiful and some obviously magical. Many of them had indeed been ordered a year before, and had come all the way from the mountain and from Dale, and were of real dwarf make. Sure. When the guest had been welcomed and was finally inside the gate, there were songs, dances, music, games, and, of course, food and drink. There were three official meals, lunch, tea, and dinner, or supper. But lunch and tea were marked chiefly by the fact that at those times all the guests were sitting down and eating okay, together. That's enough that. At other times there were merely lots of people eating and drinking continuously from 11 until 6.30, when the fireworks started. The fireworks were by Gandalf. They were not only brought by him, but designed and made by him, and the special effects, set pieces, and flights of rockets were let off by him. But there was also a generous distribution of squids, crackers, Bagaropas, sparklers, hinges, dwarf candles, elf fountains, goblin barkers, and thunderclaps. They were all superb. The art of Gandalf improved with age. There were rockets like a flight of scintillating birds singing with sweet voices. <laughs>
There were green trees with trunks of dark smoke. The leaves over like a whole spring unfolding in a moment, and their shining branches dropped glowing flowers down upon the astonished hobbits, disappearing with a sweet scent just before they touched their upturned faces. There were fountains of butterflies that bloomed literally into the trees. There were pillars of colored fires that rose and turned into eagles, or sailing ships, or a phalanx of flying swans. There was a red thunderstorm and a shower of yellow rain. There was a forest of silver spears that sprang suddenly into the air with a yell like an embattled army, and came down again into the water with a hiss like oh, a no. of snakes. And there was also one last surprise, in honor of Bilbo, and it startled the hobbits exceedingly, as Gandalf intended. The lights went out. A great smoke went up. It shaped itself like a mountain seen in the distance, and began to glow at the summit. It spouted green and scarlet flames. Out flew a red golden dragon, not like size, but terribly lifelike. Fire came from his jaws, his eyes burned down, there was a roar, and he whizzed three times over the heads of the crowd. They all ducked, and many fell flat on their faces. The dragon passed like an express train, turned a somersault, and burst over by water with a deafening explosion. That is the signal of all summer, said Bilbo. The pain and alarm vanished at once, and the prostrate hobbits leaped to their feet. There was a splendid supper for everyone, for everyone, that is, except those invited to the special family dinner party. This was held in a great pavilion with the tree. The invitations were limited to twelve dozen, a number also called by the hobbits one gross, though the word was not considered proper to use of people, and the guests were selected from all the families to which Bilbo and Frodo were related, with the addition of a few special unrelated friends, such as Gandalf. Many young hobbits were included, and present by parental permission. All hobbits were easy going with their children in the matter of sitting up late, especially when there was a chance of getting them a free meal. Bringing up young hobbits took a lot of provender. There were many baggages and boffins, and also many tooks and grand dibugs. There were various grants, relations of Bilbo Baggins' grandmother, and various chugs, connections of his to grandfather, and a selection of barrowses, bulbers, race birds, rock houses, Bodies, horn blowers, and crown boots. Some of these were only very distantly connected with Bilbo, and some of them had hardly ever been in Hobbit before, as they lived in remote corners of the Shire. The Sackville Bagginses were not forgotten. Utho and his wife Mobilia were present. They disliked Bilbo and detested Prudy, but so magnificent was the invitation card, written in old name, that they had felt it was impossible to refuse. Besides, their cousin, Bilbo, had been specializing in food for many years and his table had a high reputation. All the 144 guests expected a pleasant feast, though they rather dreaded the after-dinner speech of their host, an inevitable item. He was liable to drag in bits of what he called poetry, and sometimes, after a glass or two, would lead to the absurd adventures of his mysterious journey. The guests were not disappointed. They had an underscore very underscore pleasant feast, in fact an engrossing entertainment, rich, abundant, varied, and prolonged. The purchase of provisions fell almost to nothing throughout the district in the ensuing weeks, but as all those came in, depleted the stocks of most stores, cellars and warehouses all miles around, that did not matter much. After the feast, more or less, came the speech. Most of the company were, however, now in a tolerant mood, at that delightful stage which they called filling up the corners. They were sipping their favorite drinks, and nibbling at their favorite dainties, and their fears were forgotten. They were prepared to listen to anything, and to cheer at every full stop. Underscore my dear people underscore began Gilbert, rising in his place. Here. 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 They shouted, and kept on repeating it in chorus, seeming reluctant to follow their own advice. Bilbo left his place and went and stood on a chair under the illuminated tree. The light of the lanterns fell on his beaming face, the golden buttons shone on his embroidered silk waistcoat. They could all see him standing, waving one hand in the air, the other was in his trouser pocket. Underscore my dear bagginses and boffins underscore he began again, underscore and my dear chooks and brown eh? bucks, and grubs, and chubs, and burroses, eh? and horn girls, and bobbers, brace girls, good bodies, rock houses and proud foots dot underscore proud F-E-T, shouted an elderly hobbit from the back of the pavilion. His name, of course, was Proudfoot, and well merited, his feet were large, exceptionally furry, and both were on the table. Underscore proudfoots <laughs> underscore repeated builder. 
underscore also my loose sack your baggins is that I welcome back at last to baggins. Today is my 111th birthday. I am 91 today. Underscore hooray. Hooray! Many happy returns. They shouted, and they have a choice meal on the tables. Building was doing splendidly. This was the sort of stuff they liked, short and obvious. Underscore I hope you are all enjoying yourselves as much as I am your underscore deafening cheers. Cries of underscore yes underscore, and underscore no, dot underscore noises of trumpets and horns, pipes and flutes, and other musical instruments. There were, as has been said, many young hobbits present. Hundreds of musical crackers have been filled. Most of them bore the mark day on them, which did not convey much to most of the hobbits, but they all agreed they were marvelous crackers. They contained instruments, small, but of perfect make and enchanting tones. Indeed, in one corner some of the young kids and grand adults, suppose a young girl of it to be since he had plainly said all that was necessary, now got up an impromptu orchestra, and began a merry dance to Master Edward took a his minute grand adult got on the table and the bells in their hands began to dance the spring away, a pretty dance, but rather vigorous. But the alone had not finished. Seizing a horn from a young son nearby, he blew three loud hoots. The noise subsided. Underscore I shall not keep you long underscore, he cried. Cheers for all the assembly. Underscore I have called you all together for a purpose dot underscore something in the way that he said this made an impression. There was almost silence, and one or two of the chicks creaked up their ears. Underscore indeed, for three purposes. First of all, to tell I wanna... the that 11 years is too short a time to live among such excellent and admirable hobbits. Dot underscore tremendous outburst of approval. Underscore I don't know half of you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. Dot underscore this was unexpected and rather difficult. There was some slatted flagging, but most of them were trying to work it out and see if it came to a compliment. Underscore secondly, to celebrate my birthday dot underscore cheers again. Underscore I should say, our birthday. Point is, of course, also the birthday of my own nephew, Fredu. He comes of age and into his inheritance today dot underscore some perfunctory clapping by the elders, and some loud shouts of Fredu. Fredu. Johnny Lord Fredu from the juniors. The Sackville Baggins is scowled, wondered what was meant by coming into his inheritance. Underscore together we score 144. Your numbers were chosen to fit this remarkable total, one gross, if I may use the expression dot underscore no cheers. This was ridiculous. Many of his guests, and especially the Sackville Bagginses, were insulted, feeling sure they had only been asked to fill up the required number, like this in a package. One gross, indeed. Vulgar expression. Underscore it is also, if I may be allowed to refer to ancient history, the anniversary of my arrival by Barrett is my long name, though the fact my underscore birthday slipped my memory on that occasion. I was only 51 then, and birthdays did not seem so important. The banquet was very splendid, however, though I had a bad cold at the time, I remember, and could only say thank you very much. I now repeated it all correctly. Thank you very much for coming to my little party. Underscore. <coughs> they all feared that a song or some poetry was now imminent, and they were getting bored. Why couldn't he stop talking and let them drink his health? But Yolo did not sing all his sight. He paused for a moment. Oh my gosh, this is art imitating life, isn't it? He said, underscore, I wish to make an announcement. Underscore. He spoke his last word so loudly and suddenly that everyone sat up who still could. Underscore I Leave the lion alone! As I said, 111 years is far too short a time to spend among you. This is the end. I am going. I am leaving now. Goodbye, underscore. He stepped down and vanished. There was a blinding flash of light, and the guests all blinked. When they opened their eyes, Bilbo was nowhere to be seen. 144 flabbergasted hobbits sat back speechless. Old Odo Proudfoot removed his feet from the table and stamped. Then there was a dead silence, until suddenly, after several deep breaths, every baggins, Boffin, Took, Grand Ibuck, Grub, Chuff, Oh great. Bolder, Grace Girdle, Brockhouse, Goodbody, Hornblower, and Proudfoot began to talk at once. It was generally agreed that the joke was in very bad taste, and more food and drink were needed to cure the guests of shock and annoyance. 
his mud. I always said so was probably the most popular comment. Even it looks, with a few exceptions, the your most behavior was absurd. All the men have noted in two before granted that his disappearance was nothing more than a ridiculous crowd. But all Vori Grand I Rubber was not so sure. Rayo H. Vori in almost dinner had clouded his wits, and he said to his daughter-in-law, Esmeralda, there's something fishy in this, my dear. I believe that mad baby is off again. Silly old fool. But why worry? He hasn't taken the victuals with him. He called Lowry to for you to send the wine round again. But he was the only one present who had said nothing. For some time he had sat silent beside the rose empty chair and ignored all the masks and questions. He had enjoyed the show, of course, even though he had been in there. He had difficulty in keeping from laughter at the indignant surprise of guests. But at the same time he felt deeply troubled, he realized suddenly that he loved the old hobbit feeling. Most of the guests went on eating and drinking and discussing ill and having prodigies, past and present, though the sack of Adamses had already departed in Rome. But he did not want to have any more to do with the party. He gave orders for all wine to be served, then he got up and drained his own glass silently to the health of the other, and slipped out of the room. As all the way back, he was making a speech, he had been fingering the golden ring of his hobby. Best of three, this is ridiculous. As he stepped down, he slipped it on his finger, and he was never seen by any hobbit in hobbit again. He walked briskly back to his hole, and stood for a moment listening with a smile to the demon of the and to the sounds of men I making in other parts of the field. Then he went in. He took off his party clothes, folded up and wrapped into suit paper his embroidered silk waistcoat, and put it away. Then he put on quickly some old untidy garments, and fastened round his waist a warm leather belt. Old he had a short sword in the back of black leather stand. From a locked drawer, smelling of hot balls, he took out an old cloak and hood. They had been locked up as if they were very precious, but they were so patched and weather stained that their original color could hardly be guessed. It might have been dark green. They were rather too large for him. He then went into his study, and from a large stock box took out a bundle wrapped in old cloths, and a leather bound manuscript, and also a large bulky envelope. The book and bundle he stuffed into the top of the heavy bag that was standing there, already nearly full. Into the envelope he slipped his golden ring, and its fine chain, and then sealed it, and addressed it to Freddy. At first he put it on the mantelpiece, but suddenly he removed it and stuck it in his pocket. At that moment the door opened and Gandalf came quickly in. Oh, said Norman. I wondered if you would turn up. I am glad to find you visible, replied the wizard, sitting down in a chair. I wanted to catch you and have a few final words. I suppose you feel that everything has gone off splendidly and according to plan. Yes, I do, said Lorba. Though that flash was surprising, it quite startled me, let alone the others. A little addition of your own, I suppose. It was. You have wisely kept that ring secret all these years, and it seemed to me necessary to give your guests something else that would seem to explain your sudden vanishment. And would spoil my joke. You are an interfering old busybody laugh in order, but I expect you know best, as usual. I do think I know anything. But I don't feel too sure about this whole affair. It has now come to the final point. You have had your joke, and alarmed or offended most of your relations, and given the whole Shire something to talk about for nine days, or ninety-nine more likely. Are you going any further? Yes, I am. I feel I need a holiday, a very long holiday, as I have told you before. Probably a permanent holiday, I don't expect I shall return. In fact, I don't mean to, and I have made all arrangements. I am old, Gandalf. I don't look it, but I am beginning to feel it in my heart of hearts. Underscore well preserved underscore indeed, he snorted. Why, I feel all thin, sort of underscore stretched underscore if you know what I mean, like butter that has been scraped over too much bread. That can't be right. I need a change, or something. Gandalf looked curiously and closely at him. No, it does not seem right, he said thoughtfully. No, after all I believe your plan is probably the best. Well, I've made up my mind, anyway. I want to see mountains again, Gandalf, underscore mountains underscore and then find somewhere where I can underscore rest dot underscore in peace and quiet.
without a lot of relatives crying around, and a string of confounded visitors hanging on the bell. I might find somewhere where I can finish my book. I have thought of a nice ending for what it. What about... Underscore, and he lived happily ever oh, after to the end of his I... days. Underscore. Gandalf laughed. I hope he will. But nobody will read the book, however it ends. Oh, they may, in years to come. Fridu has read some already, as far as it has gone. <sighs> you keep an eye on Fridu, won't you? Yes, I will too, Ice, as often as I can spare them. He would come with me, of course, if I asked him. In fact, he offered to once, just before the party. But he does not really want to, yet. I want to see the wild country again before I die, and the mountains, but he is still in love with the Shire, with woods and fields and little rivers. He ought to be comfortable here. I am leaving everything to him, of course, except a few ornaments. I hope he will be happy when he gets used to being on his own. It's time he was his own master now. Everything, said Gandalf. The ring as well. You agreed to that, you remember? Well, uh, yes, I suppose so, Sam of Bilbo. Where is it? In an envelope, if you must know, said Bilbo impatiently. They're on the mantelpiece. Well, no. Here it is in my pocket. He hesitated. Isn't that odd now, he said softly to himself. Yet after all, why not? Why shouldn't it stay there? Gandalf looked again very hard at Bilbo, and there was a gleam in his eyes. I think... Bilbo, he said quietly, I should leave it behind. Don't you want to? Well, yes and no. Now it comes to it, I don't like parting with it at all, I may say. And I don't really see why I should. Why do you want me to? He asked, and a curious change came over his voice. It was sharp with suspicion and annoyance. You are always battering me about my ring, but you have never bothered me about the other things that I got on my journey. No. But I had to badger you, said Gandalf. I wanted the truth. It was important. Magic rings are well, magical, and they are rare and curious. I was professionally interested in your ring, you may say, and I still am. I should like to know where it is, if you go wandering again. Also, I think underscore you underscore have had it quite long enough. You won't need it anymore. No, no, unless I am quite mistaken. Bilbo flushed, and there was an angry light in his eyes. His kindly face grew hard. Why not? he cried. And what business is it of yours, anyway, to know what I do with my own things? It is my own. I found it. It came to me. Yes, yes, said Gandalf. But there is no need to get angry. If I am it is your fault, said Bilbo. It is mine, I tell you. My own. My precious. Yes, my precious. The wizard's face remained grave and attentive, and only a flicker in his deep eyes showed that he was startled and indeed alarmed. It has been called that before, he said, but not by you. But I say it now. And why not? Even if Gollum said the same once. It's not his now, but mine. And I shall keep it, I say. Gandalf stood up. He spoke sternly. You will be a fool if you do. Bilbo, he said. You make that clearer with every word you say. It has got far too much hold on you. Let it go. And then you can go yourself, and be free. I'll do as I choose and go as I please, said Bilbo obstinately. Now, now, my dear Hobbit. Said Gandalf. All your long life we have been friends, and you owe me something. Come. Do you <coughs> want it? Give it up. Well, if you want my ring yourself, say so cried Bilbo. But you won't get it. I won't give my precious away, I tell you. His hand straight to the hilt of his small sword. Gandalf's eyes flashed. It will be my turn to get angry soon, he said. If you say that again, I shall. Then you will see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked. He took a step towards the Hobbit, and he seemed to grow tall and menacing. His shadow filled the little room. Bilbo backed away to the wall, breathing hard his hand clutching at his pocket. They stood for a while facing one another, and the air of the room tingled. Gandalf's eyes remained bent on the hobbit. Slowly his hands relaxed, and he began to tremble. I don't know what has come over you, Gandalf, he said. You have never been like this before. What is it all about? 
It is mine, isn't it? I found it, and Gollum would have killed me if I hadn't edited it. I'm not a thief, whatever he said. I have never called you one Gandalf Fancid. And I am not one either. I am not trying to rob you, but to help you. I wish you would trust me, as you used. He turned away, and the shadow passed. He seemed to dwindle again to an old grey man, bent and troubled. Bill went through his hand over his eyes. I am sorry, he said. But I felt so queer. And yet it would be a relief in a way not to be bothered with it anymore. It has been so growing on my mind lately. Sometimes I have felt it was like I am looking at me. And I am always wondering if it's on a discipline, but don't you know, wondering if it is safe, and pulling it out to make sure. I tried locking it up, but I found I couldn't rest without it in my pocket. I don't know why. And I don't seem able to make up my mind. Then trust mine, said Gandalf. It is quite made up. Go away and leave it to have it. Stop possessing it. Give it to Frodo, and I will look after him. Bilbo stood for a moment tense and undecided. Presently he sighed. All right, he said with an effort. I will. Then he shrugged his shoulders and smiled rather ruefully. After all, that's what this party business was all about, really. To give away lots of birthday presents, and somehow make it easier to give it away at the same time. It hasn't made it any easier in the end, but it would be a pity to waste all my preparations. It would quite spoil the joke. Indeed, it would take away the only point I ever saw in the affair. Very well said, Bilbo. It goes to the doom of all the rest. He drew a deep breath. And now I really must be starting, or somebody else will catch me. I have said goodbye, and I couldn't bear to do it all over again. He picked up his bag and moved to the door. You have still got the ring in your pocket, said the wizard. Well, so I have, cried Bilbo. And my ring and all the other documents too. You had better take it and deliver it for me. That will be safest. No, don't give the ring to me, said Gandalf. Put it on the mantelpiece. It will be safe enough there, till Fadu comes. I shall wait for him. Bilbo took out the envelope, but just as he was about to set it by the clock, his hand jerked back, and the package fell on the floor. Before he could pick it up, the wizard stooped and seized it and set it in its place. A spasm of anger passed swiftly over the hobbit's face again. Suddenly it gave way to a look of relief and a laugh. Well, that's that, he said. Now I'm off. They went out into the hall. Bilbo chose his favorite stick from the stand, then he whistled. Three dwarfs came out of different rooms where they had been busy. Is everything ready? asked Bilbo. Everything packed and labeled. Everything they answered. Well, let's start then. He stepped out of the front door. It was a fine night, and the black sky was dotted with stars. He looked up, sniffing the air. What fun! What fun to be off again, off on the road with dwarfs. This is what I have really been longing for, for years. Goodbye. He said, looking at his old home and bowing to the door. Goodbye, Gandalf. Goodbye, for the present, Bilbo. Take care of yourself. You are old enough, and perhaps wise enough. Take care. I don't care. Don't you worry about me. I am as happy now as I have ever been, and that is saying a great deal. But the time has come. I am being swept off my feet at last, he added, and then in a low voice, as if to himself, he sang softly in the dark. The road goes ever on and on. <coughs> Down from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone. And I must follow, if I can. Pursuing it with eager feet. Until it joins some larger way. Where many paths and errands meet. And whither then? I cannot say. He paused, silent for a moment. Then without another word he turned away from the lights and voices in the fields and tents, and followed by his three companions went round into his garden, and trotted down the long sloping path. He jumped over a low place in the head at the bottom, and took to the meadows, passing into the night like a rustle of wind in the grass. Gandalf remained for a while staring after him into the darkness. Goodbye, my dear Bilbo, until our next meeting, he said softly and went back indoors. Fredu came in soon afterwards, and found him sitting in the dark, deep in thought. Has he gone? he asked. 
Yes, I'm sick of Delph. He has gone at last. I wish I knew. I hoped until this evening that it was only a joke said for Dick. But I knew in my heart that he really meant to go. He always used to joke about serious things. I wish I had come back sooner, just to see him off. I think really he preferred sleeping off quietly in the end, said Gandalf. Don't be too troubled. He'll be all right now. He left a package for you. There it is. Fredu took the envelope from the mantelpiece and glanced at it, but did not open it. You will find his will and all the other documents in there, I think, said the wizard. You are the master of bad end now. And also, I fancy, you will find a golden ring. The ring, exclaimed Fredu. Has he left me that? I wonder why. Still, it may be useful. It may, and it may not, said Gandalf. I should not make use of it, if I were you. But keep it secret, and keep it safe. Now I am going to bed. As Master of Bag and Fridu felt it his painful duty to say goodbye to the guests. Rumors of strange events had by now spread all over the field, but Fridu would only say underscore no doubt everything will be cleared up in the morning underscore. About midnight carriages came for the important folk. One by one they rolled away, filled with all but very unsatisfied hobbits. Gardeners came by arrangement, and ruined in wheelbarrows those that had inadvertently remained behind. The night slowly passed. The sun rose. The hobbits rose rather later. Morning went on. People came and began, by orders, to clear away the pavilions and the tables and the chairs, and the spoons and knives and bottles and plates, and the lanterns, and the flowery shrubs in boxes, and the crumbs and cracker paper, the forgotten bags and gloves and handkerchiefs, and the uneaten food, a very small item. Then a number of other people came, without all these packages, and boffins, and boilers, and tooks, and other guests that lived all were staying near. By midday, when even the best fed were out and about again, there was a large crowd at Bag End, uninvited but not unexpected. Fredu was waiting on the step, smiling, but looking rather tired and worried. He welcomed all the callers, but he had not much more to say than before. His reply to all inquiries was simply this, Mr. Bilbo Baggins has gone away, as far as I know, for good. Some of the visitors he invited to come inside, as Bilbo had left messages for them. Inside of the hall there was piled a large assortment of packages and parcels and small articles of furniture. On every item there was a label tied. There were several labels of this sort. Underscore for Adelar took, for his very own, from Elbow underscore on Arbella. Adelar had carried off many and mailed ones. Underscore for Dora Baggins in memory of a long correspondence, with love from Elbow underscore on a large waste paper basket. Dora was Drogo's sister and the eldest surviving female relative of Bilbo and Fridu. She was 99, and had written reams of good advice for more than half a century. Underscore for Milo Burrows, hoping it will be useful, from B.B. underscore on a gold pen and ink bottle. Milo never answered letters. Underscore for Angela at use, from Uncle Bilbo underscore on a round convex mirror. She was a young baggins, and too obviously considered her face shaving. Underscore for the collection of Hugo Brace Girdle, from a contributor underscore on an empty bookcase. Hugo was a great borrower of books, and worse than usual at returning them. Underscore for the lady at Sackville Baggins, as a present underscore on a case of silver spoons. Bilbo believed that she had acquired a good many of his spoons, while he was away on his former journey. Lavinia knew that quite well. When she arrived later in the day, she took the point at once, but she also took the spoons. This is only a small selection of the assembled presents. Bilbo's residence had got rather cluttered up with things in the course of his long life. It was a tendency of Hobbit holes to get cluttered up, for which the custom of giving so many birthday presents was largely responsible. Not, of course, that the birthday presents were always underscore new underscore there were one or two old underscore matters underscore of forgotten uses that had circulated all around the district, but Bilbo had usually given new presents, and kept those that he received. The old hole was now being cleared a little. Every one of the various parting gifts had labels, written out personally by Bilbo, and several had some point, or some joke. But, of course, most of the things were given where they would be wanted and welcome. The poorer hobbits, and especially those of Bad Short Row, did very well. 
Old Gaffer Gundy got two sacks of potatoes, a new spade, a woolen waistcoat, and a bottle of ointment for creaking joints. Old Rory Brandiva, in return for much hospitality, got a dozen bottles of old vineyards, a strong red wine from the South Farthing, and now quite mature, as it had been laid down by Bilbo's father. Rory quite forgave Bilbo, and voted him a capital fellow after the first bottle. There was plenty of everything left for Fredu. And, of course, all the chief treasures, as well as the books, pictures, and more than enough furniture, were left in his possession. There was, however, no sign nor mention of money or jewelry, not a penny piece or a glass bead was given away. But he had a very trying time that afternoon. A false rumor that the whole household was being distributed free spread like wildfire, and before long the place was packed with people who had no business there, but could not be kept out. Labels got torn off and mixed, and quarrels broke out. Some people tried to do swaps and deals in the hall, and others tried to make underscore of underscore with minor items not addressed to them, or with anything that seemed unwanted or unwatched. The road to gate was blocked with barrows and hand hearts. In the middle of the commotion a sack Bill Bagginses arrived. Fredu had retired for a while and left his friend Mary Graham Dyer to keep an eye on things. When that whole hour he demanded to see Fredu, Mary bowed politely. He is indisposed, he said. He is resting. Hiding, you mean, said Lobelia. Anyway we want to see him and we mean to see him. Just go and tell him so. Mary left them a long while in the hall, and they had time to discover their parting gift of spoons. It did not improve their tenders. Eventually they were shown into the study. Fredu was sitting at a table with a lot of papers in front of him. He looked indisposed to see that Bill Baggins at any rate, and he stood up, fidgeting with something in his pocket. But he spoke quite politely. The sack Bill Bagginses were rather offensive. They began by offering him bad bargain prices, as between friends, for various valuable and unlabeled things. When Fredu replied that only the things specially directed by Bilbo were being given away, they said the whole affair was very fishy. Only one thing is clear to me, said Otto, and that is that you are doing exceedingly well out of it. I insist on seeing the will. Otto would have been Bilbo's heir, but for the adoption of Fredu. He read the will carefully and snorted. It was, unfortunately, very clear and correct, according to the legal customs of hobbits, which demand among other things seven signatures of witnesses in red ink. Foiled again, he said to his wife. And after waiting underscore sixty underscore years. Soons. Fiddlesticks. He snapped his fingers under Fredu's nose and slumped off. But Lobelia was not so easily got rid of. A little later Fredu came out of the study to see how things were going on and found still about the place, investigating nooks and comers and tapping the floors. He escorted her firmly off the premises, after he had relieved her of several small, but rather valuable, articles that had somehow fallen inside her umbrella. Her face looked as if she was in the throes of thinking about a really crushing part of the world, but all she found to say, turning the under the stairs. You mean you have to regret it, my fellow? Why didn't you go to? You don't belong here. You're no back into you, you're a grand buck. Did you hear that, Mary? That was an insult. If you like, said Fredu as he shut the door on her. It was a compliment, said Mary Grand buck, and so, of course, not true. Then they went round the hole and evicted three young hobbits, two boffins and a boulder, who were knocking holes in the walls of one of the cellars. Fredu also had a tussle with young Sanko Proudfoot, old Odo Proudfoot's grandson who had begun an excavation in the larger pantry, where he thought there was an echo. The legend of Bilbo's gold excited both curiosity and hope, for legendary gold, mysteriously obtained, if not positively ill-gotten, is, as everyone knows, any one is for the finding unless the search is interrupted. <clears throat> when he had overcome Sanko and pushed him out, Fredu collapsed on a chair in the hall. It's time to close the shop, Mary, he said. Lock the door, and don't open it to anyone today, not even if they bring a battering ram. Then he went to revive himself with a belated cup of tea. Assassin! And he sat down, when there came a soft knock at the front door. Nabilia again most likely, he thought. She must have thought of something really nasty, and have come back again to say it. It can wait. He went on with his tea. The knock was repeated, much louder, but he took no notice. Suddenly the wizard's head appeared at the window. If you don't let me in, 
Pridu, I shall blow your door right down your hole and out through the hill, he said. My dear Gandalf. Half a minute, cried Pridu, running out of the room to the door. Come in. Come in. I thought it was Lobelia. Then I forgive you. But I saw her some time ago, driving a pony trap towards by water with a face that would have curdled new milk. She had already nearly curdled me. Honestly, I nearly tried on Bilbo's ring. I'm not to disappear. Don't do that, said Gandalf, sitting down. Do be careful of that ring, Frodo. In fact, it is partly about that that I have come to say a last word. Well, what about it? What do you know already? Only what Bilbo told me. I have heard his story, how he found it, and how he used it, on his journey, I mean. Which story, I wonder, said Gandalf. Oh, not what he told the dwarfs and put in his book, said Fridu. He told me the true story soon after I came to live here. He said you had pestered him till he told you, so I had better know too. No secrets between us, Fridu, he said, but they are not to go any further. It's mine anyway. That's interesting, said Gandalf. Well, what did you think of it all? If you mean, inventing all that about a present, well, I thought the true story much more likely, and I couldn't see the point of altering it at all. It was very unlike Bilbo to do so, anyway, and I thought it rather odd. So did I. But odd things may happen to people that have such treasures if they use them. Let it be a warning to you to be very careful with it. It may have other powers than just making you vanish when you wish to. I don't understand, said Fridu. Neither do I answer the wizard. I have really begun to wonder about the ring, especially since last night. No need to worry. But if you take my advice you will use it very seldom, or not at all. At least I beg you not to use it in any way that will cause talk or rouse suspicion. I say again, keep it safe, and keep it secret. You are very mysterious. What are you afraid of? I am not certain, so I will say no more. I may be able to tell you something when I come back. I am going off at once, so this is goodbye for the present. He got up. At once, cried Fridu. Why, I thought you were staying on for at least a week. I was looking forward to your help. I did mean to, but I have had to change my mind. I may be away for a good while, but I'll come and see you again, as soon as I can. Except me when you see me. I shall slip in quietly. I shan't often be visiting the Shire openly again. The smell of danger. I rather unpopular. They say I am a nuisance and a disturber of the peace. Some people are actually accusing me of spiriting the bow away, or worse. If you want to know, there is supposed to be a plot between you and me to get hold of his wealth. Some people explain... What challenges, what glory, what... How abominable. What are you going on about? I would give the back end and everything else, if I could get Bilbo back and go off tramping in the country with him. Oh. I love the shy. Right, one sec. But I begin to wish, oh. somehow, that I had gone to. I wonder if I shall ever see him again. So do I, said Gandalf. And I wonder many other things. Goodbye now. Take care of yourself. Look out for me, especially at unlikely times. Goodbye. Fridu saw him to the door. He gave a final wave of his hand, and walked off at a surprising pace, but Fridu thought the old wizard looked unusually bent, almost as if he was carrying a great weight. The evening was closing in, and his cloaked figure quickly vanished into the twilight. Fridu did not see him again for a long time. Underscore chapter 2 underscore. The shadow of the past. The talk did not die down in 9 or even 99 days. The second disappearance of Mr. Bilbo Baggins was discussed in Hobbiton, and indeed all over the Shire, for a year and a day, and was remembered much longer than that. It became a fireside story for young hobbits, and eventually Mad Baggins, who used to vanish with a bang and a flash that made became a favorite long after all the true events were But in the meantime, the general opinion in the neighborhood of the gone quite mad, and had <laughs> There he had undoubtedly fallen into a pool or a river and come to a tragic, but hardly an untimely end. The blame was mostly laid on Gandalf. If only mm. that right wizard will leave young Fridu alone, perhaps he'll settle down and grow some hobbit sense, they said. And 
Some junkie was sitting in one corner near the fire, and opposite him was Tip Sunderman, the miller's son, and there were various other rustic hobbits listening to their talk. Queer things you do here these days, to be sure, said Sam. Ask Ted, you, if you listen. But I can hear fireside tales and children's stories at home, if I want to. No doubt you can retort it, Sam, and I dare say there's more truth in some of them than you reckon. You invented the stories anyway. Take dragons now. No thank you, said Ted, I won't. I heard tell of them when I was a youngster, but there's no more to believe in them now. There's only one dragon in my water, and that green is in, getting a general laugh. All right, said Sam, laughing with the rest. But what about these tree men, these giants, as you might call them? They do say that one bigger than a tree was seen up away beyond the north walls not long back. Who's underscore they underscore? My cousin Hal for one. He works for Mr. Boffin at Overhill and goes up to the north farthing for the hunting. He underscore saw underscore one. Says he did, perhaps. Your Hal's always saying he's seen things, and maybe he sees things that ain't there. But this one was as big as an elm tree, and walking walking seven yards to a stride, if it was an inch. Then I bet it wasn't an inch. What he saw underscore... Am I supposed to see what that says? Not. But this one was underscore walking underscore... Why underscore is the screen so small? No elm tree on the north laws. Then Hal can't have seen one, said Ted. There was some laughing and clapping. The audience seemed to think that Ted had scored a point. All the same, said Sam, you can't deny that others besides our hard fast have seen queer folk crossing the Shire crossing it. Mind you, there are more that are turned back at the borders. The Bounders have never been so busy before. And I've heard tell that elves are moving west. They do say they are going to the harbors, out away beyond the White Towers. Sam Where am I trying to get to? Where am I? How far it was to the sea, past the old towers beyond the western borders of the Shire. Why is the screen so small? That's a way over their stupid great havens, from which in time Kelvin ships set sail, never to return. They are sailing, sailing, sailing over the sea. They are going into the west and leaving us, said Sam, half chanting the words, shaking his head sadly and solemnly. But Ted laughed. Well, that isn't anything new, if you believe the old tales. And I don't see what it matters to me or you. Let them sail. But I warrant you haven't seen it nor anyone else in the Shire. Well, I don't know, said Sam thoughtfully. He believed he had once seen an elf in the woods, and still hoped to see more one day. Of all the legends that he had heard in his early years, such patterns of tales and half remembered stories about the elves as the hobbits knew, had always moved him most deeply. There are some, even in these parts, as know the fair folk and get news of them, he said. There's Mr. Baggins now, that I work for. He told me that they were sailing and he knows a bit about elves. And old Mr. Bilbo knew more, made a little pie had with him when I was a little lad. Oh, they're both cracked, said Ted. Leastways old Bilbo was cracked, and produced cracking. If that's where you get your news from, you will never want for moonshine. Well, thanks, I'm off home. Your good health. He drained his mug and went out noisily. Sam sat silent and said no more. He had a good deal to think about. For one thing, there was a lot to do up in the back end garden, and he would have a busy day tomorrow, if the weather cleared. The grass was growing fast. But Sam had more on his mind than gardening. After a while he sighed, and got up and went out. It was early April and the sky was now clearing after heavy rain. The sun was down, and a cool pale evening was quietly fading into night. He walked home under the only stars through Hollyton and up the hill, whistling softly and thoughtfully. It was just at this time that Gandalf reappeared after his long absence. For three years after the party he had been away. Then he paid for a brief visit, and after taking a good look at him he went off again. During the next year or two he had turned up fairly often, coming unexpectedly after dusk, and going off without warning before sunrise. He would not discuss his own business and journeys, and seemed chiefly interested in small news about Fridu's health and doings. Then suddenly his visits had ceased. It was only nine years since Fridu had seen or heard of him, and he had begun to think that the wizard would never return and had given up all interest in hobbies. But that evening, as Sam was walking home and twilight was fading, there came the once familiar tap and a sudden ear. 
but he welcomed his old friend with surprise and great delight. They looked hard at one another. Albany, said Gandalf. You look the same as ever, for you. So do you, for you, replied, but secretly he thought that I don't remember where I went. I know. He pressed him for news of himself and of the white world, and soon they were deep in talk, and they stayed up far into the night. Next morning after a late breakfast, the wizard was sitting with Fudu by the open window of the study. A bright fire was on the hearth, but the sun was warm, and the wind was in the south. Everything looked fresh, and the new green of spring was shimmering in the fields and on the tips of the tree's fingers. Gandalf was thinking of the spring, nearly 80 years before, when Bilbo had run out of back end without a handkerchief. His hair was perhaps whiter than it had been then, and his beard and eyebrows were perhaps longer, and his face grew like hair and wisdom, but his eyes were as bright as ever, and he smoked and blew his fingers with the same vigor and delight. He was smoking now in silence, for Fudu was sitting still, deep in thought. Even in the light of morning he felt the dark shadow of the tidings that Gandalf had brought. At last he broke the silence. Last night you began to tell me strange things about my ring, Gandalf, he said. And then you stopped, because you said that such matters were best left until daylight. Don't you think you had better finish now? You say the ring is dangerous, far more dangerous than I guess. In what way? In many ways, answered the wizard. It is far more powerful than I ever dared to think at first. So powerful that in the end it would utterly overcome any one of the mortal race who possessed it. It would possess him. In the region long ago many elven rings were made, magic rings as you call them, and they were, of course, of various kinds, some more potent and some less. The lesser rings were only essays in the craft before it was full grown, and to the elven smiths they were their trifles yet still to my mind dangerous for mortals. But the great rings, the rings of power, they were perilous. A mortal, for who keeps one of the great rings, does not die, but he does not grow or obtain more life, he merely continues, until at last every minute is a weariness. And if he often uses the ring to make himself invisible, he underscore fates underscore he becomes in the end invisible permanently, and walks in the twilight under the eye of the dark power that rules the rings. Yes, sooner or later later, if he is strong or well-meaning to begin with, but at neither strength nor good purpose will last, sooner or later the dark power will devour him. How terrifying, said Fudu. There was another long silence. The sound of Sam Gandhi cutting the lawn came in from the garden. How long have you known this? asked Fudu at length. And how much did Bilbo know? Bilbo knew no more than he told you, I am sure, said Gandalf. He would certainly never have passed on to you anything that he thought would be a danger, even though I promised to look after you. He thought the ring was very beautiful, and very useful at need, and if anything was wrong or queer, it was himself. He said that it was growing on his mind, and he was always worrying about it, but he did not suspect that the ring itself was to blame. Though he had found out that the thing needed looking after, it did not seem always of the same size or weight, it shrank or expanded in an odd way, and might suddenly slip off a finger where it had been tight. Yes. He warned me of that in his last letter, said Fudu, so I have always kept it on its chain. Very wise, said Gandalf. But as for his long life, Bilbo never connected it with the ring at all. He took all the credit for that to himself, and he was very proud of it. Though he was getting restless and uneasy. <sighs> underscore thin and stretched underscore, he said. A sign that the ring was getting control. How long have you known all this? asked Fudu again. Said Gandalf. I have known much as only the wise known, for you. But if you mean only about underscore this underscore ring, well, I still do not underscore no underscore I might say. There is a last test to make. But I no longer doubt my guess. When did I first begin to guess? He mused, searching back in memory. Let me see if it in the year that the White Council drove the dark power from Mirkwood, just before the Battle of Five Armies, that Bilbo found his ring. A shadow fell on my heart then, though I did not know yet what I feared. I wondered often how Gollum came by a great ring, as plainly it was that at least was clear from the first. Then I heard all those strange story of how he had won it, and I could not believe it. When I at last got the truth out of him, I saw at once that he had been trying to put his claim to the ring beyond doubt. Much like Gollum with his birthday present, the lies were too much for my comfort. 
clearly the ring had done holes and power that set to work on its keeper at once. That was the first real warning I had that all was not well. I told Bill how often that such rings were better left unused, but he resented it, and soon got angry. There was little else that I could do. I could not take it from him without doing greater harm, and I had no right to do so anyway. I could only watch and wait. I might perhaps have consulted some man the white, but something always held me back. Who is he? asked Fredu. I had never heard of him before. Maybe not answered Gandalf. Hobbits are, or were, no concern of his. Yet he is great among the wise. He is the chief of my order and the head of the council. His knowledge is deep, but his pride has grown with it, and he takes so many meddling. The law of the Elven Rings, great and small, is his province. He has long studied it, seeking the lost secrets of their making. But when the rings were debated in the council, all that he would reveal to us of his own law told against my fears. So my doubts left us uneasily. Still I watched and I waited. And all seemed well with Bilbo. And the years passed. Yes, they passed, and they seemed not to touch him. He showed no signs of age. The shadow fell on me again. But I said to myself, after all he comes of the long-lived family on his mother's side. There is time yet. Wait. And I waited. Until that night when he left this house. He said he did things and that filled me with the fear that no words of sorrow man could make. I knew at last that something dark and deadly was at work. And I have spent most of the years since then in finding out the truth of it. There wasn't any permanent harm done, was there? asked Freddy anxiously. He would get all right in time, wouldn't he? Be able to rest in peace, I mean. He felt better at once, said Gandalf. But there is only one power in this world that knows all about the rings and their effects, and as far as I know there is no power in the world that knows all about hobbits. Among the wise I am the only one that goes in for hobbit law, an obscure branch of knowledge, but full of surprises. Soft as butter they can be, and yet sometimes as tough as old tree roots. I think it likely that someone resists the rings far longer than most of the wise would believe. I don't think you need worry about Bilbo. Of course, he possessed the ring for many years, and used it, so it might take a long while for the influence to wear off before it was safe for him to see it again, for instance. Otherwise, he might live on for years, quite happily, just stop as he was when he parted with it. For he gave it up in the end of his own accord, an important point. No, I was not troubled about the Bilbo anymore, once he'd let the thing go. It is for underscore you underscore that I feel responsible. Ever since Bilbo left I have been deeply concerned about you, and about all these charming, absurd, helpless hobbits. It would be a grievous blow to the world, if the dark power overcame the Shire, if all your kind, jolly, stupid boulders, horn blowers, boffins, brace girdles, and the rest, not to mention the ridiculous vagances, became enslaved. Fritu shuddered. But why should we be, he asked. And why should he want such slaves? To tell you the truth, replied Gandalf, I believe that he the two underscore he the two underscore mark you he has entirely overlooked the existence of hobbits. You should be thankful. But your safety has passed. He does not need you, he has many more useful servants, but he won't forget you again. And hobbits as miserable slaves would please him far more than hobbits happy and free. There is such a thing as malice and revenge. Revenge, said Fredu. Revenge for what? I still don't understand what all this has to do with Bilbo and myself, and our ring. It has everything to do with you, You do not know the real pain yet, yeah. but you shall. I was not sure of it myself when I was last here, but the time has come to speak. Give me the ring for a moment. Fredu took it from his breeches pocket, where it was clasped to the bone that hung from his belt. He unfastened it and handed it slowly to the wizard. Yes, that's good. It felt suddenly very heavy, as if either it or Fredu himself was in some way reluctant for Gandalf to touch it. Gandalf held it up. It looked to be made of pure and solid gold. Can you see any markings on it? he asked. No, said Fredu. There are none. It is quite plain, and it never shows a scratch or sign of wear. Well then, look. To produce astonishment and distress the wizard threw it suddenly into the middle of a glowing corner of the fire. 
Fudu gave a cry and groped for the tolls, but Gandalf held him back. Wait, he said in a commanding voice, giving Fudu a quick look from under his bristling brows. No apparent change came with the grinning. After a while Gandalf got up, closed the shutters outside the window, and drew the curtains. The room became dark and silent, though the clack of sun's shears, now nearer to the windows, could still be heard faintly from the garden. For a moment the wizard stood looking at the fire, then he stooped and removed the ring to the hearth with the tongs, and at once picked it up. Fudu gasped. It is quite cool, said Gandalf. Take it. Fudu received it on the shrinking hand. He seemed to have become bigger and heavier than ever. Hold it up, said Gandalf. And he closed it. As Fudu did so, he now saw fine lines, finer than the finest pen strokes, running along the ring, outside and inside, lines of fire that seemed to form the letters of a flowing script. They shone piercingly bright, and yet remote, as if out of a great depth. I cannot read the fiery letters said Fudu in a quavering voice. No, said Gandalf, but I can. The letters are elvish, of an ancient mode, but the language is out of order, which I will not utter here. But this in the common tongue is what is said, close enough. Underscore one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them. One ring to bring them all and in the darkness find them but underscore. It is only two lines of a verse long known in Elven law. Underscore three rings for the Elven kings under the sun. Seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone. Nine for mortal men doomed to die. One for the dark lord on his dark throne. In the land of the water where the shadows lie. One ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all and in the darkness find them. In the land of Mordor where the shadows lie underscore. He paused, and then said slowly in a deep voice, This is the master ring, the one ring to rule them all. This is the one ring that he lost many ages ago, to the great weakening of his power. He greatly desires it but he must underscore not underscore get it. Fudu sat silent and motionless. Fear seemed to stretch out a vast hand, like a dark cloud rising in the east and looming up to engulf him. This ring, he stammered. How, how on earth yeah. did it come to me? Ah, said Gandalf. That is a very long story. The beginnings lie back in the black years, which only the law masters now remember. If I were to tell you all that tale, we should still be sitting here when spring had passed into winter. But last night I told you of Sauron the Great, the Dark Lord. The rumors that you have heard are true, he has indeed arisen again and left his hold in Mirkwood and returned to his ancient fastness in the Dark Tower of Mordor. That name even you hobbits have heard of, like a shadow on the borders of old stories. Always after a defeat and a respite, the shadow takes another shape and grows again. I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Fridu. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. And already, Fridu, our time is beginning to look black. The enemy is fast becoming very strong. His plans are far from ripe, I think, but they are ripening. We shall be hard put to it. We should be very hard put to it, even if it were not for this dreadful chance. The enemy still lacks one thing to give him strength and knowledge to beat down all resistance, break the last defenses, and cover all the lands in the second darkness. He lacks the one ring. The three, fairest of all, the elf lords hit from him and his hand never touched them or sullied them. Seven the dwarf kings possessed, but three he has recovered, and the others the dragons have consumed. Nine he gave to mortal men, proud and great, and so ensnared them. Long ago they fell under the dominion of the one, and they came in wraiths, shadows under his great shadow, his most terrible servants. Long ago. It is many a year since the nine walked abroad. Yet who knows? As the shadow grows once more, they too may walk again. But come. We will not speak of such things even in the morning of the Shire. So it is now, the nine he has gathered to himself, the seven also, or else they are destroyed. The three are hidden still. But that no longer troubles him. He only needs the one, for he made that ring himself, it is his, and he let a great part of his own former power pass into it, so that he could rule all the others. If he recovers it, 
then he will calm them all again, wherever they be, even the three, and all that has been wrought with them will be laid there, and he will be stronger than ever. And this is the dreadful chance, for do. He believed that the one had perished, that the elves had destroyed it, as should have been done. But he knows now that it has underscore not underscore perished, that it has been found. So he is seeking it, seeking it, and all his thought is bent on it. It is his great hope and our great fear. Why, why wasn't it destroyed? cried Fridu. And how did the enemy ever come to lose it, if he was so strong, and it was so precious to him? He clutched the ring in his hand, as if he saw already dark fingers stretching out to seize it. It was taken from him, said Andalf. The strength of the elves to resist him was great among them, and not all men were estranged from them. The men of Western is came to their aid. That is a chapter of ancient history which it might be good to recall, for there was sorrow then too, and gathering dark, but great valor and heavy things that were not wholly vain. One day, perhaps, I will tell you all the tale, or you shall hear it told in full by one who knows it best. But for the moment, since most of all you need to know how this thing came to you, and that will be tale enough, this is all that I will say. It was Gilgalad, Elven King and Elendil of Westernis who overthrew Sauron, when they themselves perished in the deed, and Isildur Elendil's son cut the ring from Sauron's hand and took it for his own. Then Sauron was vanquished and his spirit fled and was hidden for long years, until his shadow took shape again in Mirkwood. But the ring was lost. It fell into the great river, Anduin, and vanished. All Isildur was marching north along the east banks of the river, and near the gladdened fields he was waylaid by the orcs of the mountains, and almost all his folk were slain. He leaped into the waters, but the ring slipped from his finger as he swam, and then the orcs saw him and killed him with arrows. Gandalf paused. And there in the dark pools amid the gladdened fields he said, the ring passed out of knowledge and legend, and even so much of its history is known now only to a few, and the counsel of the wise can discover no more. But at last I can carry on the story, I think. Long after, but still very long ago, there lived by the banks of the great river on the edge of Wildland a clever-handed and quiet-footed little people. I guess they were of the kind, akin to the fathers of the fathers of the stores, for they loved the river, and often swam in it, or made little boats of reeds. There was none of them a family of high repute, for it was large and wealthier than most, and it was ruled by a grandmother of the folk, stern and wise in old law, such as they had. The most inquisitive and curious-minded of that family was called Smegol. He was interested in roots and beginnings, he dived into deep pools, he burrowed under trees and growing plants, he tunneled into green mounds, and he ceased to look up at the hilltops, or the leaves on trees, or the flowers opening in the air, his head and his eyes were downward. He had a friend called Eagle, of similar sort, sharper eyed but not so quick and strong. On a time they took a boat and went down to the gladden fields, where there were great beds of iris and flowering reeds. There Smigol got out and went nosing about the banks but Deal sat in the boat and fished. Suddenly a great oh, no. fish took his hook, and before he knew where he was, he was dragged out and down into the water, to the bottom. Then he let go of his line, for he thought he saw something shining in the riverbed, and holding his breath he grabbed at it. Then up he came spluttering, with weeds in his hair and a handful of mud, and he swam to the bank. And behold, when he washed the mud away, there in his hand lay a beautiful golden ring, and it shone and glittered in the sun, so that his heart was glad. But Smegol had been watching him from behind a tree, and as Deal floated over the ring, Smegol came softly up behind. Give us that, Deal, my love said Smegol, over his no. face shoulder. Why? Said Deal. <sighs> because it's my birthday, my love, and I want it, said Smegol. I don't care, said Deal. I have given you a present already, more than I could afford. I found this, and I'm going to keep it. No. Oh, are you indeed? I'm never going to make the 15 minute mark. This is crap. And strangled him, because the gold looks so bright and beautiful. Then he put the ring on his finger. No one ever found out what had become of Deal. He was murdered far from home, and his body was cunningly hidden. But Smegol returned alone, and he found that none of his family could see him, when he was wearing the ring. He was very pleased with his discovery and he concealed it, and he used it to find out secrets, and he was astonished to his given malicious uses. He became sharp-eyed and keen-eared for all that was hurtful. The ring had given him power according to his stature. 
It is not to be wondered at that he became very unpopular and was shunned, when Gizel, by all his relations. They hit him, and he bit their feet. He took to peeling, and going about muttering to himself, and gurgling in his throat. So they called him underscore golem underscore and cursed him, and told him to go far away, and his grandmother, desiring peace, expelled him from the family and turned him out of her home. He wandered in loneliness, weeping a little for the hardness of the world, and he journeyed up the river, till he came to the stream that flowed down from the mountains, and he went that way. He caught fish in the pools with invisible fingers and did them all. One day it was very hot, and as he was bending over a pool, he felt a burning on the back of his head, and a dazzling light from the water pained his wet eyes. He wondered at it, for he had almost forgotten about the sun. <laughs> the last time he looked up and shook his fist at her. But as he lowered his eyes, he saw far above the tops of the misty mountains, out of which the stream came. And he thought suddenly, it would be cool and shady under those mountains. The sun could not wash me there. The roots of those mountains must be roots indeed. There must be great secrets buried there which have not been discovered since the beginning. So he journeyed by night up into the highlands. And he found a little cave out of which the dark stream ran, and he wormed his way like a maggot into the heart of the hills, and vanished out of all knowledge. The ring went into the shadows with him, and even the maker, when his power had begun to grow again, could learn nothing of it. Gollum, cried Frodo. Gollum. Do you mean that this is the very Gollum creature that Elmo met? How loathsome. I think it is a sad story, said the wizard, and it might have happened to others, even to some hobbits that I have known. I can't believe that Gollum was connected with hobbits, however distantly said Fridu with some heat. What an abominable notion. It is true all the same, replied Dandan. About their origins, at any rate, I know more than hobbits do themselves. And even though those stories suggests the kinship. There was a great deal in the background of their minds and memories that was very similar. They understood one another remarkably well, very much better than a hobbit would understand, say, a dwarf, or a orc, or even an elf. Think of the riddles they both knew, for one thing. Yes, said Fruity. Though other folks besides hobbits ask riddles, and of much the same sort. And hobbits don't cheat. Gollum meant to cheat all the time. He was just trying to put poor Elmo off his guard. And I dare say it amused his wickedness to start a game which might end in providing him with an easy victim, but if he lost would not hurt him. Only too true, I fear, said Gandalf. But there was something else in it, I think, which you don't see yet. Even Gollum was not wholly ruined. He had proved tougher than even one of the wise would have guessed as a hobbit might. There was a little corner of his mind that was still his own, and light came through it, as through a chink in the dark, light out of the past. It was actually pleasant, I think, to hear a kindly voice again, bringing up memories of wind, and trees, and sun on the grass, and such forgotten things. But that, of course, would only make the evil part of him angrier in the end unless it could be conquered. Unless it could be cured. Gandalf sighed. Alas. There is little hope of that for him. Yet not no hope. No, not though he possessed the ring so long, almost as far back as he can remember. For it was long since he had worn it much, in the black darkness it was seldom needed. Certainly he had never faded. He is thin and tough still. But the thing was eating up his mind, of course, and the torment had become almost unbearable. All the great secrets under the mountains had turned out to be just empty nut. There was nothing more to find out, nothing worth doing, only nasty furtive eating and resentful remembering. <sighs> he was altogether wretched. He hated the dark, and he hated light more, he hated everything, and the ring most of all. What do you mean, said Fridu. Surely the ring's his precious and the only thing he cared for. But if he hated it, why didn't he get rid of it, or go away and leave it? You ought to begin to understand, Fridu, after all you have heard, said Gandalf. He hated it and loved it, as he hated and loved himself. He could not get rid of it. He had no more left in the matter. The ring of power looks after itself, for you. Underscore it underscore may slip off treacherously, but it still never abandons it. At most he plays with the idea of handing it on to someone else's care and that only at an early stage, when it first begins to grip. But as far as I know Bilbo alone in history has ever gone beyond playing, and really done it. 
He needed all my help, too. And even so he would never have just forsaken it, or cast it aside. It was not Gollum, Fridu, but the ring itself that decided things. The ring left underscore him underscore. What, just in time to meet Bilbo, said Fridu. Wouldn't he or have suited it better? It is no laughing matter, said Gandalf. Not all you. It was the strangest event in the whole history of the ring so far. Bilbo's arrival just at that time, and putting his hand on it, blindly, in the dark. There was more than one power at work, Fridu. The ring was trying to get back to its master. It has lived on Isildur's hand and betrayed him, then when a chance came it caught poor Deal, and he was murdered, and after that Gollum, and it had devoured him. It could make no further use of him, he was too small and mean, and as long as it stayed with him he would never leave his deep pool again. So now, when its master was awake once more and sending out his dark ord from Riverwood, it abandoned Gollum. Only to be picked up by the most unlikely person imaginable, Bilbo from the Shire. Behind that there was something else at work, beyond any design of the ringmaker. I can put it no plainer than by saying that Bilbo was underscore meant underscore to find the ring, and underscore not underscore by its maker. In which case you also were underscore meant underscore to have it. And that may be an encouraging thought. It is not said for you. Though I am not sure that I understand you. But how have you learned all this about the ring, and about Gollum? Do you really know it all, or are you just guessing still? Gandalf looked at Fridu, and his eyes glinted. I knew much and I have learned it much, he answered. But I am not going to give an account of all my doings to underscore you dot underscore the history of Elendil and Isolda and the One Ring is known to all the wise. Your ring is shown to be that One Ring by the fire writing alone, apart from any other evidence. And when did you discover that? asked Fridu, interrupting. Just now in this room, of course, answered the wizard sharply. But I expected to find it. I have come back from dark journeys and long search to make that final test. It is the last proof, and all is now only too clear. Making out Gollum's part, and fitting it into the gap in the history, required some thought. You may have started with guesses about Gollum, but I am not guessing now. I know. I have seen him. You have seen Gollum, exclaimed Fridu in amazement. Yes. The obvious thing to do, of course, if one could. I tried long ago, but I have managed it at last. But then what happened after Bilbo escaped from him? Do you know that? Not so clearly. What I have told you is what Gollum was willing to tell though not, of course, in the way I have reported it. Gollum is a liar, and you have to sift his words. For instance, he called the ring his birthday present, and he stuck to that. He said it came from his grandmother, who had lots of beautiful things of that kind. A ridiculous story. I have no doubt that Smegol's grandmother was a matriarch, a great person in the way, but to talk of her possessing many elder rings oh, no. was absurd, and as for giving them away, it was a lie. Mm. But a lie with a grain of truth. The murder of Deal haunted Gollum, and he had made up a defense, repeating it to his precious over and over again, as he gnawed bones in the dark, until he almost believed it. It underscores underscore his birthday. Deal ought to have given the ring to him. It had previously turned out just so as to be a present. It underscore was underscore his birthday present, and so on, and on. I endured him as long as I could, but the truth was desperately important, and in the end I had to be harsh. I put the fear of fire on him, and run the true story out of him, bit by bit, together with much sniveling and snarling. He thought he was misunderstood and ill-used. But when he had at last told me his history, as far as the end of the riddle game and Bilbo's escape, he would not say any more, except in dark hints. Some other fear was on him greater than mine. He muttered that he was going to gel his own back. People would see if he would stand being kicked, and driven into a hole and then underscore of dot underscore Gollum had good friends now, good friends and very strong. They would help him. Baggins would pay for it. That was his chief thought. He hated Bilbo and cursed his name. What is more, he knew where he came from. But how did he find that out? asked Fridu. Well, as for the name, Bilbo very foolishly told Gollum himself, and after that it would not be difficult to discover his country, once Gollum came out. Oh yes, he came out. His longing for the ring proved stronger than his fear of the orcs, or even the light. 
after a year or two he left the mountains. You see, though still bound by desire of it, the ring was no longer devouring him, he began to revive a little. He felt old, terribly old, yet less timid, and he was mortally hungry. But, might of sun and moon, he still feared and hated, and he always will, I think, but he was cunning. He found he could hide from daylight and moonshine, and make his way swiftly and softly by dead of night with his pale cold eyes, and can't the fight the moonlight. Oh. He grew stronger and bolder with new food and new air. He found his way into Mirkwood, as one would expect. Is that where you found him? asked Fridu. I saw him there, answered Gandalf. But before that he had wandered far, following Milbo's trail. It was difficult to learn anything from him for certain, for his talk was constantly interrupted by curses and threats. What had it got in its pockets is? He said. It wouldn't say, no precious. Little cheat. Not a fair question. It cheated first, it did. It broke the rules. We ought to have squeezed it, yes precious. And we will, precious. That is a sample of his talk. I don't suppose you want any more. I had weary days of it. But from hints dropped among the snarls I even gathered that his padding feet had taken him at last to Escaro, and even to the streets of Dale, listening secretly and peering. Well, the news of the great events went far and wide in the wilderness, and many had heard Milbo's name and knew where he came from. We had made no secret of our return journey to his home in the west. Gollum's sharp ears would soon learn what he wanted. Then why didn't he track Milbo further? asked Fudu. Why didn't he come to the Shire? asked Gandalf. Now we come to it. I think Gollum tried to. He set out and came back westward, as far as the Great River. But then he turned aside. He was not daunted by the distance, I am sure. No, something else drew him away. So my friends think, those that hunted him for me. The wood elves tracked him first, an easy task for them, for his trail was still fresh there. Through Mirkwood and back again at Melbourne, though they never caught him. The wood was full of the rumor of him, dreadful tales even among beasts and birds. The woodman said that there was some new terror abroad, a ghost that drank blood. It climbed trees to find nests, it crept into holes to find the young, it slipped through windows to find cradles. But at the western edge of Mirkwood the trail turned away. It wandered off southwards and passed out of the wood elf's hair, and was lost. And then I made a great mistake. Yes, for you, and not the first, though I fear it may prove the worst. I let the matter be. I let him go, for I had much else to think of at that time, and I still trusted the law of Saru. No. Oh, that was years ago. I have paid for it since with many dark and dangerous days. The trail was long cold when I took it up again, after Bill left here. And my search would have been in vain, but for the help that I had from a friend, Aragorn, the greatest traveller and huntsman of this age of the world. Together we sought for going down the whole length of Wilderland, without hope, and without success. But at last, when I had given up the chase and turned to other parts, Gollum was found. My friend returned out of the great perils bringing the miserable creature with him. What he had been doing he would not say. He only wept and called us cruel, with many a underscore golem underscore in his throat, and when we pressed him he whined and cringed, and rubbed his long hands, licking his fingers as if they pained him, as if he remembered some old torture. But I am afraid there is no possible doubt, he had made his slow, sneaking way, step by step, mile by mile, south, down and last to the land of Mordor. A heavy silence fell in the room. For you could hear his heart beating. Even outside everything seemed still. No sound of such shears can now be heard. Yes, to Morda said Gandalf. Alas. Morda draws more wicked things, and the dark power was bending all its will to gather them there. The real the enemy would leave its mark, to leave him open to the summons. And all folk were whispering then of the new shadow in the south, and its hatred of the west. There were his fine new friends, who would help him in his revenge. Rashid fool. In that land he would learn much, too much for his comfort. And sooner or later as he lurked and cried on the boards he would be caught and taken for his animation. That was the way of it, I think. When he was found he had already been there long and was on his way back. On some errand of mischief. But that does not matter much now. 
his worst mischief was done. Yes, alas. Through him the enemy has learned that one has been found again. He knows where Isildur fell. He knows where Gollum found his ring. He knows that it is a great ring, for it gave long life. He knows that it is not one of the three, for they have never been lost, and they endure no evil. He knows that it is not one of the seven, or the nine, for they are accounted for. He knows that it is the one. And he has at last heard, I think, of underscore of his underscore and the underscore fire dot underscore. The shire he may be seeking for it now, if he has not already found out where it lies. Indeed, Fredu, I fear that he may even think that the little unnoticed name of underscore baggins underscore has become important. But this is terrible, cried Fredu. Far worse than the worst that I imagined from your hints and warnings. Oh Gandalf, best of friends, what am I to do? For now I am really afraid. What am I to do? What a pity that Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had a chance. Pity. It was pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy not to strike without need. And he has been well rewarded, Fredu. Uh, to show that he took so little hurt from the evil, and escaped in the end, because he began his ownership of the race. With pity. I am sorry, said Fredu. But I am frightened, and I do not feel any pity for Gollum. You have not seen him, Gandalf broke in. No, and I don't want to, said Fredu. I can't understand you. Do you mean to say that you, and the elves, have let him live on after all those horrible deeds? Now at any rate he is as bad as an orc, and just an enemy. He deserves death. Deserves it. I don't say he does. Many that live deserve death. And some that die deserve life. How do you give it to them? They do not be too eager to deal out death in judgment. For even the very wise cannot see all ends. I have not much hope that Gollum can be cured before he dies, but there is a chance of it. And he is bound up with the fate of the ring. My heart tells me that he has some part to play yet, for good or ill, before the end, and when that comes, the pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many yours not least. In any case we did not kill him, he is very old and very wretched. The Wood Elves have him in prison, but they treat him with such kindness as they can find in their wise hearts. All the same said Fredu, even if Bilbo could not kill Gollum, I wish he had not kept the ring. I wish he had never found it, and that I had not got it. Why did you let me keep it? Why didn't you make me throw it away, or, or destroy it? Let you. Make you, said the wizard. Haven't you been listening to all that I have said? You are not thinking of what you are saying. But as for throwing it away, that was obviously wrong. These rings have a way of being found. In evil hands it might have done great evil. Worst of all, it might have fallen into the hands of the enemy. Indeed it certainly would, for this is the one, and he is exerting all his power to find it or draw it to himself. Of course, my dear Fredu, it was dangerous for you, and that has troubled me deeply. But there was so much at stake that I had to take some risk though even when I was far away there has never been a day when the Shire has not been guarded by watchful eyes. As long as you never used it, I did not think that the ring would have any lasting effect on you, not for evil, not at any rate for a very long time. And you must remember that nine years ago, when I last saw you, I still knew little for certain. But why not destroy it, as you say should have been done long ago, cried Fredu again. If you had warned me, or even sent me a message, I would have done away with it. Would you? How would you do that? Have you ever tried? No. But I suppose one could hammer it or melt it. Try, said Gandalf. Try now. Fredu drew the ring out of his pocket again and looked at it. It now appeared plain and smooth, without mark or device that he could see. The gold looked very fair and pure, and Fredu thought how rich and beautiful was its color, how perfect was its roundness. It was an admirable thing and altogether precious. When he took it out he had intended to fling it from him into the very hottest part of the fire. But he found now that he could not do so, not without a great struggle. He weighed the ring in his hand, hesitating, and forcing himself to remember all that Gandalf had told him, and then with an effort of will he made a movement, as if to cast it away but he found that he had put it back in his pocket. Gandalf laughed grimly. You see, already you too, Fredu, cannot easily let it go, nor will to damage it. 
and I could not make you accept by force, which would break your mind. But as for breaking the ring, force is useless. Even if you took it and struck it with a heavy spread hammer, it would make no dent in it. It cannot be unmade by your hands, or by mine. Your small fire, of course, would not melt even ordinary gold. This ring has already passed through it unscathed, and even unheated. But there is no sweet sport in this shire that could change it at all. Not even the anvils and furnaces of the dwarfs could do that. It has been said that dragon fire did melt and consume the rings of power, but there is not now any dragon left on earth in which the old fire is hot enough, nor was there ever any dragon, not even Caligan the Black, who could have harmed the one ring, the ruling ring, for that was made by Sauron himself. There is only one way, to find the cracks of doom in the depths of Orodruin, the fire mountain, and cast the ring in there, if you really wish to destroy it, to put it beyond the grasp of the enemy forever. I do really wish to destroy it, cried Fredu. Or, well, to have it destroyed. I am not made for perilous quests. I wish I had never seen the ring. Why did it come to me? Why was I chosen? Such questions cannot be answered, said Gandalf. You may be sure that it was not for any merit that others do not possess, not for power or wisdom, at any rate. But you have been chosen, and you must therefore use such strength and heart and wits as you have. But I have so little of any of these things. You are wise and powerful. Will you not take the ring? No, cried Gandalf, springing to his feet. With that power I should have power too great and terrible. And over me the ring would gain a power still greater and more deadly. His eyes flashed and his face was lit as by a fire within. Do not tempt me. For I do not wish to become like the Dark Lord himself. Yet the way of the ring to my heart is by pity, pity for weakness and the desire of strength to do good. Do not tempt me. I dare not take it, not even to keep it safe, unused. The wish to wield it would be too great, for my strength. I shall have such need of it. Great perils lie before me. He went to the window and drew aside the curtains and the shutters. Sunlight streamed back again into the room. Sam passed along the path outside the zone. And now said the wizard, turning back to Fudu, the decision lies with you. But I will always help you. He laid his hand on Fudu's shoulder. I will help you bear this burden, as long as it is yours to bear. But we must do something, soon. The enemy is moving. There was a long silence. Van Dow sat down again and puffed at his pipe, as if lost in thought. His eyes seemed closed. But under the lids he was watching Fridu intently. Fridu gazed fixedly at the red embers on the hearth, until they filled all his vision, and he seemed to be looking down into profound wells of fire. He was thinking of the fabled cracks of doom and the terror of the fiery mountain. Well, said Gandalf at last. What are you thinking about? Have you decided what to do? No, answered Fridu, coming back to himself out of darkness, and finding to his surprise that it was not dark and that out of the window he could see the sunlit garden. Or perhaps, yes. As far as I understand what you have said, I suppose I must keep the ring and guard it, at least for the present, whatever it may do to me. Whatever it may do, it will be so, slow to evil, if you keep it with that purpose, said Gandalf. I hope so, said Freddy. But I hope that you may find some other better keeper soon. But in the meanwhile it seems that I am a danger, a danger to all that live near me. I cannot keep the ring and stay here. I ought to leave back and leave the Shire, leave everything and go away. He sighed. I should like to save the Shire, if I could though there have been times when I thought the inhabitants too stupid and dull for worse, and have felt that an earthquake or an invasion of dragons might be good for them. But I don't feel like that now. I feel that as long as the Shire lies behind, safe and comfortable, I shall find wandering more bearable, I shall know that somewhere there is a firm foothold, even if my feet cannot stand there again. Of course, I have sometimes thought of going away, but I imagine that as a kind of holiday, a series of adventures might build those for better, ending in peace. But this would mean exile, a flight from danger to danger, drawing it after me. And I suppose I must go alone, if I am to do that and save the Shire. But I feel very small, and very uprooted, and well desperate. The enemy is so strong and terrible. 
You ought to go quietly, and you ought to go soon, said Gandalf. Two or three weeks had passed, and still Frodo made no sign of getting ready to go. I know. But it is difficult to do both, he objected. If I just vanish like Gollum, the tale will be all over the Shire in no time. Of course you mustn't vanish, said Gandalf. That wouldn't do at all. I said underscore soon underscore not underscore instantly dot underscore if you can think of any way of slipping out of the Shire without its being generally known, it will be worth a little delay. But you must not delay too long. What about the autumn, or oh, after our birthday, asked Frodo. I think I could probably make some arrangements by then. To tell the truth, he was very reluctant to start, now that it had come to a point. Bag End seemed a more desirable residence than it had for years, and he wanted to save her as much as he could of his last summer in the Shire. When autumn came, he knew that part of so his heart would be more kindly of journeying, as it always did at that season. Okay. <laughs> he had indeed privately made <laughs> up his mind to leave on his 50th birthday, Bilbo's 128th. He seemed somehow the proper day on which to set out and follow him. Following Bilbo was uppermost in his mind, and the one thing that made the thought of leaving bearable. He thought as little as possible about the ring, and where it might lead him in the end. But he did Why not have all the thoughts to land out. Sharing so much. What the wizard guessed was always difficult to tell. Why? He looked at Bilbo and smiled. Very well, he said. I think that will do, but it must not be any later. I am getting very anxious. In the meanwhile, do take care, and don't let out any hint of where you are going. And see that Sam Gamby does not talk. If he does, I really shall turn him into a toad. As for underscore where I underscore am going, said Prudu, it would be difficult to give it away, for I have no clear idea myself, yet. Don't be absurd, said Gandalf. I am not warning you against leaving an address at the post office. But you are leaving the Shire and that should not be known, until you are far away. And you must go, or at least set out, either north, south, west or east and the direction should certainly not be known. I have been so taken up with the thoughts of leaving Bag End, and of saying farewell, that I have never even considered the direction set for you. For where am I to go? And by what shall I steer? What is to be my quest? Will they wait to find a treasure, there and back again? But I go to lose one, and not return, as far as I can see. But you cannot see very far, said Gandalf. Neither can I. It may be your task to find the cracks of doom, but that quest may be for others, I do not know. At any rate, you are not ready for that long road yet. No indeed, said Frodo. But in the meantime, what course am I to make? Towards danger, but not too rashly, nor too straight, answered the wizard. If you want my advice, may fall of the door. That journey should not prove too perilous, though the road is less easy than it was, and it will grow worse as the year fails. Rivendell, said Frodo. Very good, I will go east, and I will make for Rivendell. I will take Sam to visit the elves, he will be delighted. He spoke lightly, but his heart was moved suddenly with a desire to see the house of Elrond Half-Elven, and greet the air of that deep valley where many of the fair folk still dwelt in peace. One summer's evening an astonishing piece of news reached the underscore ivy bush underscore and underscore green dragon dot underscore giants and other portents on the borders of the Shire were forgotten for more important matters. Mr. Fredu was selling bag end, indeed he had already sold it to the sack of baggingses. One nice bit, Lou said some. At a bargain price said others, and that's more likely when mistress of Abelia is the buyer. Our toe had died some years before, at the right but disappointed age of 102. Just why Mr. Frodo was selling his beautiful hole was even more debatable than the price. A few held the theory supported by the knots and hints of Mr. Baggins himself that Frodo's money was running out. He was going to leave Hobbiton and live in a quiet way on the proceeds of the sale down in Buckland among his grand Ivark relations. As far from the Sackville Baggins as may be some added. But so firmly fixed had a notion of the immeasurable wealth of the Bagginses of Bag End become that most found this hard to believe, harder than any other reason or unreason that their fancy could suggest. To most it suggested a dark and yet under the alley plot by Gandalf. Though he kept himself very quiet and did not go about by day, it was well known that he was highly honored in the Bag End. But however removal might fit in with the designs of his wizardry, there was no doubt about the fact, for Doom Baggins was going back to Buckland. Yes, I shall be moving this autumn, he said. 
Very glad I got is looking out for a nice little hole for me, or perhaps a small house. As a matter of fact, with Mary's help, he had already chosen and bought a little house at Crick Hollow in the country beyond Buckleberry. To all that son, he pretended he was going to settle down there permanently. The decision to set out Eastwoods had suggested the idea to him, for Buckland was on the eastern borders of the Shire, and as he had lived there in childhood, his going back would at least seem credible. Gandalf stayed in the Shire for over two months. Then one evening, at the end of June, soon after the Fredoof's plan had been finally arranged, he suddenly announced that he was going off again next morning. Only for a short while, I hope he said. But I am going down beyond the southern borders to get some news, if I can. I have been idle longer than I should. He spoke lightly, but it seemed to Fredoof that he looked rather worried. Has anything happened? he asked. Well no, but I have heard something that has made me anxious and needs looking into. If I think it necessary after all for you to get off at once, I shall come back immediately, or at least send word. In the meanwhile stick to your plan, but be more careful than ever, especially of the rain. Let me impress on you once more, underscore don't use it. Underscore. He went off at dawn. I may be back any day, he said. At the very latest I shall come back for the farewell party. I think after all you may need my company on the road. At first Fredu was a good deal disturbed, and wondered often what Gandalf could have heard, but his uneasiness wore off, and in the fine weather he forgot his troubles for a while. The Shire had seldom seen so fair a summer, or so rich an autumn. The trees were laden with apples, honey was dripping in the cones, and the corn was tall and full. Autumn was well underway before Fredu began to worry about Gandalf again. September was passing and there was still no news of him. The birthday, and the removal, drew nearer, and still he did not come, or send word. That then began to be busy. You're the onion Some kid. of the news friends came to stay and help him with the packing. There was Fredy at the Volga and Volga Bobby, and of course his special friends <sighs> with him to the Mary Grand Dibuck. Between them they turned the whole base upside down. On the 20th of September two covered carts went off later to Buckland. Conveying the furniture and goods that Fredu had not sold to his new home, by way of the branded one wish. The next day Fredu became really anxious, and kept a constant lookout for Gandalf. Thursday, the third day morning, dawned as fair and clear as it had long ago for the Rose Ray party. Still Gandalf did not appear. In the evening Fredu gave his farewell feast, it was quite small, just a dinner for himself and his four helpers, but he was troubled and fell in no mood for it. The thought that he would so soon have to part with his young friends weighed on his heart. He wondered how he would break it to them. The four younger hobbits were, however, in high spirits, and the party soon became very cheerful in spite of Gandalf's absence. The dining room was there except for a table and chairs, but the food was good, and there was good wine. Produce wine had not been included in the sale to the Sackville audiences. Whatever happens to the rest of my stuff, when the SV.S get their claws on it, at any rate I have found a good home for this, said Fredu, as he drained his glass. It was the last drop of old vineyard. When they had sung many songs, and talked of the many things they had done together, they toasted Bilbo's birthday, and they drank his health and produced together according to Fredu's custom. Then they went out for a sniff of air, and glimpse of the sauce, and then they went to bed. Fredu's party was over, and Gandalf had not come. The next morning they were busy packing another cart with the remainder of the luggage. Mary took charge of this, and drove off with Fatty, that is Fredia Gavolga. Someone must get there and warm the house before you arrive, said Mary. Well, see you later the day after tomorrow, if you don't go to sleep on the way. Fulco went home after lunch, but Pippin remained behind. Fredu was restless and anxious, listening in vain for a sound of Gandalf. He decided to wait until nightfall. After that, if Gandalf wanted him urgently, he would go to Crick Hollow, and might even get there first. For Fredu was going on foot. His plan for pleasure and a last look at the Shire as much as any other reason was to walk from Hobbit to Buckleberry Ferry, taking it fairly easy. I shall get myself a bit into training. Too, he said, looking at himself in a dusty mirror in the half-empty hall. He had not done any strenuous walking for a long time, and the reflection looked rather flabby, he thought. After lunch, the Sackville Baggins's, Lobelia and her son-to-head son, Lobo, turned up, much to Fredu's annoyance. 
pounds and lost, said Lavinia, as she stepped inside. It was not light, nor strictly true, for the sale of that end did not take effect until midnight. But Lavinia can perhaps be forgiven, she had been obliged to wait about 77 years longer for that end than she once hoped, and she was now a hundred years old. Anyway, she had come to see that nothing she had paid for had been carried off, and she wanted the keys. It took a long while to satisfy her, as she had brought a complete inventory with her and went right through it. In the end she departed with Lobo and the spare key and the promise that the other key would be left at the Gandhi's in Bagshot Road. She snorted, and showed plainly that she thought the Gandhi's capable of plundering the hole during the night. Fudu did not offer her any tea. He took his own tea with Pippin and Sam Gandhi in the kitchen. It had been officially announced that Sam was coming to our van to do for Mr. Fudu and look after his bit of garden, an arrangement that was approved by the gaffer, though he did not consult before the prospect of having the bleeding as a neighbor. Our last meal at Bag End, said Fudu, pushing back his chair. They left the washing up for Abelia. Pippin and Sam strapped up their three packs and piled them in the porch. Pippin went out for a last stroll in the garden. Sam disappeared. The sun went down. Bag and seemed sad and gloomy and disheveled. Fruity wandered round the familiar rooms, and saw the light of the sunset fade on the walls, and shadows creep out of the corners. It grew slowly dark indoors. He went out and walked down to the gate at the bottom of the path and then on a short way down the hill road. He half expected to see Gandalf come striding up through the dusk. The sun was clear and the stars were growing bright. It's going to be a fine night, he said aloud. That's good for a beginning. I feel like walking. I can't bear any more hanging about. I am going to start, and Gandalf must follow me. He turned to go back, and then stopped, for he heard voices, just round the corner by the end of that shot road. One voice was certainly the old gaffer's, the other was strange, and somehow unpleasant. He could not make out what it said, but he heard the gaffer's answers, which were rather shrill. The old man seemed to get out. No, Mr. Baggins has gone away. Went this morning, and my son went with him, anyway all his stuff went. Yes, sold out and gone, I tell you. Why? Why is none of my business, or yours? Where to? That ain't no secret. He's moved to Buckleberry or some such place, a way down Wanda. Yes, it is a tidy way. I've never been so far myself, there are queer folks in that land. No, I can't give no message. Good night to you. Footsteps went away down the hill. For you wondered vaguely why the fact that they did not come on up the hill seemed a great relief. I am sick of questions and curiosity about my doings, I suppose he thought. What an inquisitive lot they all are. He had half a mind to go and ask the gaffer who the inquirer was, but he thought better, or worse, of it, and turned and walked quickly back to that end. Pippin was sitting on his pack in the porch. Sun was not there. Fudu stepped inside the dark door. Sun, he called. Sun. Time. Coming, sir, came the answer from far within, followed soon by Sun himself, wiping his mouth. He had been saying farewell to the beer barrel in the cellar. All aboard, Sam, said Fudu. Yes, sir. I'll last for a bit now, sir. Fudu shut and locked the round door, and gave the key to Sam. Run down with this to your home, Sam, he said. Then cut along the row and meet us as quick as you go at the gate in the lane beyond the meadows. We are not going through the village tonight. Too many ears pricking and eyes crying. Sam ran off at full speed. Well, now we're off at last, said Fredu. They shouldered their packs and took up their sticks, and walked round the corner to the west side of Bag End. Goodbye, said Fredu, looking at the dark blank windows. He waved his hand, and then turned and, following Bilbon, if he had known it, hurried after Peregrine down the garden path. They jumped over the low place in the hedge at the bottom and took to the fields, passing into a darkness like rustle in the grasses. At the bottom of the hill on its western side they came to a gate opening onto a narrow lane. There they halted and adjusted the straps of their packs. Presently Sam appeared, trotting quickly and breathing hard, his heavy pack was hoisted high on his shoulders, and he had put on his head a tall shapeless fell back, which he called a hat. In the gloom, he looked very much like a dwarf. I am sure you have given me all the heaviest 
stuff said Bridget. I pitched his nails and all that carried their hose on their backs. I could take a lot more yet, sir. My packet is quite light, said Sam soundly and untruthfully. No, you don't, Sam, said Pippin. It is good for him. He's got nothing except what he ordered us to pack. He's been slack lately, and he'll feel the weight less when he's walked off some of his own. Be kind to a poor old hobbit, laughed Pridu. I shall be as thin as a willow wand, I'm sure, before I get to Buckland. But I was talking nonsense. I suspect you have taken more than your share, Sam, and I shall look into it at our next packing. He picked up his stick again. Well, we all like walking in the dark, he said, so let's put some miles behind us before bed. For a short way they followed the lane westwards. Then leaving it they turned left and took quietly to the fields again. They went in single file along hedgerows and the borders of coppices, and night fell dark about them. In their dark cloaks they were as invisible as if they all had magic rings. Since they were all hobbits, and were trying to be silent, they made no noise that even hobbits would hear. Even the wild things in the fields and woods hardly noticed their passing. After some time they crossed the water, west of Hobbiton, by a narrow plank bridge. The stream was then no more than a winding black ribbon, bordered with leaning under trees. A mile or two further south they hastily crossed the great road from the Brandywine Bridge, they were now in the Tukund and bending southeastwards they made for the Greenhill country. As they began to climb its first slopes they looked back and saw the lamps in Hobbit and far off twinkling in the gentle valley of the water. Soon it disappeared in the folds of the darkened land, and was followed by dry water beside its grey pool. When the light of the last farm was far behind, peeping among the trees, Fadu turned and waved a hand in farewell. I wonder if I shall ever look down into that valley again, he said quietly. When they had walked for about three hours they rested. The night was clear, cool, and starry, but smoke like wisps of mist were creeping up the hillsides from the streams and deep meadows. Thin clad birches, swaying in the light wind above their heads, made a black net against the pale sky. They ate a very frugal supper, four hobbits, and then went on again. Soon they struck a narrow road, that went rolling up and down, fading grey into the darkness ahead, the road to Woodhall, and Sock, and the Buckleberry Ferry. It climbed away from the main road in a water valley, and wound over the skirts of the green hills towards Woody End, a wild corner of the East Farthing. After a while they plunged into a deeply cloven track between tall trees that rustled their dry leaves in the night. It was very dark. At first they talked, or hummed a few softly together, being now far away from inquisitive ears. Then they marched on in silence, and Pippin began to lag behind. At last, as they began to climb a steep slope, he stopped and yawned. I am so sleepy, he said, that soon I shall fall down on the road. Are we going to sleep on your legs? It is nearly midnight. I thought you liked walking in the dark, said Freddy. But there is no great hurry. Mary expects us sometime the day after tomorrow, but that leaves us nearly two days more. We will halt at the first likely spot. The winds in the west, said Sam. If we get to the other side of this hill, we shall find a spot that is sheltered and snug enough, sir. There is a dry firm just ahead, if I remember rightly. Sam knew land well within 20 miles of Hobbiton, but that was the limit of his geography. Just over the top of the hill they came on the patch of firwood. Leaving the road they went into the deep resin scented darkness of the trees, and gathered dead sticks and coats to make a fire. Soon they had a merry crackle of flame at the foot of a large fir tree and they sat round it for a while, until they began to nod. Then, each in an angle of the great tree's roots, they curled up in their cloaks and blankets, and were soon fast asleep. They set no watch, even for Duke feared no danger yet, for they were still in the heart of the Shire. A few creatures came and looked at them when the fire had died away. A fox passing through the wood on business of his own stopped several minutes and sniffed. Hobbits, he thought. Well, what next? I have heard of strange doings in the sand, but I have seldom heard of a hobbit sleeping out of doors under a tree. Three of them. There's something mighty queer behind this. He was quite right, but he never found out any more about it. The morning came. Everyone's been turned into a ghost. Walking for pleasure. Why didn't I drive? He thought, as he usually did at the beginning of an expedition. 
and all my beautiful fellow beds are sold to the Sackville Bagginses. These twins don't do them good. He stretched. Wake up, Hobbits, he cried. It's a beautiful morning. What's beautiful about it, said Pippi, peering over the edge of his blanket with one eye. Sam. Gel breakfast ready for half past nine. Have you got the bath water hot? Sam jumped up, looking rather weary. No, sir, I haven't, sir, he said. Purdue stripped the blankets from Pippin and rolled him over, and then walked off to the edge of the wood. Away he stood, the sun was rising red out of the mists that lay thick on the world. Touched with gold and red, the autumn trees seemed to be sailing rootless in a shadowy sea. A little blue hint of death, the rope ran down steeply into a hollow and disappeared. When he returned, Sam and Pippin had got a good fire going. Water, shouted Pippin. Where's the water? I don't keep water in my pockets, said Prudu. We thought you had gone to find some, said Pippin, busy setting out the food and cups. You had better go now. You can come too, said Prudu, and bring all the water bottles. There was a stream at the foot of the hill. They filled their bottles and the small camping kettle at a little fall where the Again, by simply listening, slow down, see just how peaceful today could be. Well, that was an interesting episode. As good as they've ever been, if I do say so myself. Thanks so much for swinging by. Catch you guys on the flip side. Okay, bye. They went down the slope and across the stream where it dived under the road and up the next slope and up and down another shoulder of the hills and by that time their clothes, blankets, water, food and other gear already seemed a heavy burden.